Hello, welcome to Jibrin Angle on Oleke TV. My name is Jibrin and this is my angle. Um, I have uh, today with me, as always, Barista Austin Manta, who shall be having a discussion with me um, about, about several issues um, that ranges from the judiciary to the national issues to um, to churches um, with uh, churches and the private investment. We shall be talking about churches uh, that are so rich uh, that invested uh, the founders um, invested uh, used uh, church church money to invest in private businesses. We shall be talking about that. We shall also be talking about the U.S. politics. Um, we, uh, our discussion around the U.S. politics is uh, for the purpose of uh, juxtaposing it, comparing it with uh, what we have going on in Nigeria, um, either right now or before now, uh, sort of. So we just want to make comparison with the political climates and the politicians in Nigeria and that of the U.S. and the situations. Um, around both, uh, both countries. Uh, like I said earlier, um, the judiciary, we shall be talking about uh, the judiciary, we shall focus on uh, the uh, judicial conducts generally. As we all know, um, over the years, and it has become, it seemed to have degenerated into a very, very alarming situation where um, some people may call it judicial rascality is being displayed. Um, I, 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 I think I, 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 I rather use a, a, a deeper word than rascality. This, rascality means something that is just um, probably you're just trying to play with something or whatever. Um, I, I, it goes beyond that. It's gone beyond rascality. It's gone. It's 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 now impunity. And um, with a whole lot of um, disdain and disregard for the entire disrespect for the entire system, which is uh, which is unpatriotic. Um, so we shall be talking about all that. But before then, let's welcome our guest, Barrister Austin Manta. You're welcome to the show again. Thank you for um, taking out time out of your busy schedule to be here again. Thank you very much. All right, um, viewers. Again, this is um, Jibrin Angle. Um, if you are the if you are a first timer here, please um, we urge you to subscribe to this uh, platform, Willeke TV. We are on all social major social media platform, and set on your notification bell so that whatever and whenever we upload any, we have any of our content. Um, on the air, you will be notified to watch it. Our content, we have various contents on this platform. Jibril Angle is one of the interesting and insightful uh, programs we have on this channel. And um, so you will never, you will be happy you, you actually did if you do uh, subscribe. And uh, for those that are that are return audience um, or viewers, we appreciate we appreciate your encouragement because uh, returning means um, it's either you are interested, you are uh, interested in what we are doing, or you are trying to encourage us uh, to do more, to grow rather, and we appreciate that so much and um, say thank you. Uh, okay, um, that being said. Let's delve into um, the nitty gritty of what we have today. Uh, Marissa, um, now you are in the best position to discuss our first topic, which has to do with the judiciary. Uh, for those of you who are, who are joining us for the first time, Barista Austin Manta is a very, very senior lawyer of 40 years, exactly. I think he clocked 40 years in legal pra practice this year. I think um, a few months or a few weeks ago. And um, so we cannot be discussing with a better person than him. He is um, he's a very, very senior lawyer and a lawyer who has, 
actually specialized. All he has done is in his entire career, in his entire um, career has always been um, practicing law. He's been in active. When I say someone um, is 40 years in practice, has spent 40 years in practice, it's, it's, it is literal. When he say right, it is literally so in practice, everything about him is law. So that means um, it can never we can we can't get it uh, better with him. We can't get it better with anyone when it comes to um, his knowledge and expertise um, of law. Um, so Barista, the judiciary has you 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 and I have you've complained about this thing over the years from the Obasanjo time era up to this moment, um, it, it never got better. Um, it has gotten, it has, it has rather gotten worse than, than ever. It's, it, has, it is sliding so fast. The, the, the integrity and the responsibility and the seriousness, the decency, the decorum, the orderliness of the court is being eroded so fast, so fast that uh, um, it's becoming a mess. It's making a mess of the entire system. As we all know, there is no system that succeeds, that survives without justice, without the judiciary. The judiciary is the hub, uh, is the pivot of any civilized, any civilized, not even in, when I civilized or not civilized. Even uncivilized, because a uh, judiciary is uh, is dated back uh, in the Bible days, where I think Moses was the first first person that instituted the judiciary, where we have uh, the, the high courts, appeal courts, and supreme. He, but Moses, Moses in the Bible was the person who actually instituted those three courts, stages of uh, of justice. Where you have the high court, the uh, the appeal court, and the uh, court of uh, uh, and the supreme court, so um, so it is not it's not about justice, is not about civility. That just the truth. So it's been it's established that justice is um, is should be the norm. It should be a part of human race, human life. Um, it should be a part of our being, part of our existence. So as such, it is very, very, very important. It's one of the most important um, aspects or elements of our day-to-day -day life. Because without justice, without, without the judiciary, um, the entire system, every entire society will be in, in anarchy. And that is just it. There will be serious anarchy everywhere. It will be lawlessness. And um, life will be very, very living. Living will be a very, very... Um, um, unbearable situation for anyone, especially those that are that are living responsibly and decently. So um, it's so important, uh, barrister. We all know what is happening. You have complained bitterly about this. Um, so you have been an antagonist of the rots in the judiciary. Um, the latest is the one that is going on in uh, um, Kano State at the moment, where you have um, the same um, court of uh, same jurisdiction, um, having releasing conflicting orders or injunction, whatever you guys call it. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this is, uh, it is, I don't, I don't understand. First and foremost, uh, well, my problem is why we, we, I, 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 it, this is, this is, um, it is, to me, it is, again, it is one of one, what I, I consider to be injustice. Injustice in the sense that um, judicial officials or officers or practitioners, that is uh, the, uh, the people um, at the bench, they, they, they seem not to have punishment for misconduct, for doing something wrong. Okay, not let me not say they seem not to happen, but their punishment is not worth it. Let, I think that's the right word. Um, so we shall be talking about that. Uh, what happens to judicial misconduct? People who engage in judicial rascality, as some people call it, the judicial irresponsibility, uh, sort of unlike someone who commits a crime, who steals, and the person is sentenced to jail. 
someone who beats up someone, someone who molests someone, person is sentenced to jail. And other people, other people that commit crime, even people in their respective professions, they do one thing, don't want misconduct or the other, out of uh, to do something that is not within the ethics of their profession, not within the rules and the profession policies and the uh, policies and the principles of their profession. And uh, some of these um, omissions or commissions uh, are actually, uh, 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 some of them are actually criminal. And some of the officials, some of the professionals are sent, sentenced to jail, punished by really real punishment by sentencing them to jail. Well, what happens in the, what, in the case of judicial officials, I, I, I don't know, are they, are they God? They, are they, uh, I don't understand if they are God that such, they cannot, I've not had a situation where a judicial official or a, or either a judge or a justice of the of the Supreme Court or judge of the High Court or the RP Court or whatever was I, our magistrate even was actually sentenced to jail for um, official misconduct. Sometimes this what we call what we call misconduct could be gross misconduct because these judges are so powerful that they can they they, they actually they, they they sentence people to death. Uh, they sentence people to life imprisonment. Their, what, their pronouncements are, are, are life-changing. Their pronouncements are so grave that um, there should be such kind of responsibility should come with, with deterrence, should come with a kind of a punishment. It's sort of, but um, globally, it's not, this, that is not the case. Sorry, I have to beat everywhere at the same time because the whole thing is also frustrating to me. I've talked about the judicial stuff for a while, I've really, really been concerned about the kind of power arrogated to, to judicial officials, a sort of, or officers. Uh, so please, uh, first, let's start with the canon situation. Um, we talked about it, I think, about some few days ago. However, um, I think uh, this it, it cannot be this this topic cannot be overemphasized. Um, what is your opinion? on the crazy situation in our judiciary, um, especially with the latest situation where you have two, two, two courts going at each other. Um, first of all, give us a summary of what you think about that. Uh, thank you very much, Jibrin. Um Discussing the judiciary for me personally is a very emotional, issue for the fact that I have spent all my adult life in that um, sector. And secondly, for the fact that the justice is the anchor of a stable society. And that justice is prepared by an independent and no corrupt judiciary. So when you come to the Nigerian judiciary, some of us have met it decades ago, and we are here today. We are in a position to assess what we met on ground and how it has transformed over the years to what it is today. We I am one of the first persons that always criticize the judiciary that it is not going in the right direction. And for many reasons, it's actually a topic that will, if one wants to do justice, it will take a fairly long time. But let me first mention the issue of Kano before I come back to the general discussion on the judiciary. Uh, you are aware of the develop, uh, developments in Kano where the governor, the House of Assembly, repealed an existing law and also canceled every appointment that was made under the repeat law. And then the governor reappointing the former emir, uh, Lamido Sanusi, that had been removed uh, back then in 2019. And the ensuing uh, 
consequences, so to speak, and which are still going on, even as we speak, because the matter has not been resolved properly. We heard that a federal high court gave an order to the former emir, Ado Bayero, to remain as the emir and to have all his rights and privileges as emir to be retained. And this was an ex party order. We have a state high court in Kano that came up and said, look, the police should remove the former emir from his seat and he should stop parading himself as an emir. We still have another federal high court in Kano. In Kano, there are two federal high court judges. So one, the, the second one has also weighed in on the matter. This is highly regrettable. And it's one of the things we have been complaining about, that the judiciary does not seem to be going in a progressive direction. It seems to be going down just like the politicians have seemed to be uh, seem to be dragging the country down they are also dragging the judiciary down with it and it's very very uh, unfortunate we live in the judiciary we continue to live there the justice delivery system has been adversely affected over the decades that I have been there and the problem is always associated mostly with politicians. During military regimes, well, the, the, the military would promulgate a decree that whatever they do, the judiciary should not uh, counter it. In a way, they will, they will come out clearly and say, look, we are doing this and we own the jurisdiction of the courts. Let them not interfere. But when we come to a democratic government, of which the judiciary is a cardinal arm out of the three arms. We expect, one, the independence of the judiciary, and two, the erudition and strength of the judiciary. All the two have been eroded over time. So we see political interference in the judiciary at virtually every level. And what is playing out in Kano cannot be divorced from political interference in the judiciary. Otherwise, as I've mentioned before on this forum, these issues have been resolved by the highest court of the land, the Supreme Court, many, many years ago, even two decades ago. How do we come today, after 20-something years, and be dragging something that the Supreme Court has already laid to rest? The Federal High Court has no jurisdiction in chieftaincy matters. The uh, deposed emir who went to the Federal High Court to enforce his fundamental rights, those fundamental rights are ancillary or derived from his deposition as an emir. And this is exactly what happened in the case of the emir of Muri when he was uh, removed. He too went to Federal High Court and said, my fundamental rights to freedom to this thing have been I want I want you to grant me an order to maintain my privileges to maintain my fundamental rights and the matter went all the way the Supreme Court said no these fundamental rights you are talking about derive from your deposition as an emir being a chieftaincy matter the federal high court has no jurisdiction so how do we come to something years ago for a federal high court judge who has practiced law for a minimum of 10 years to be doing the same thing that the Supreme Court has condemned, it can only be because of some other subterranean uh, factors interfering in that process. The only court that could properly handle this matter is the state high court. Now, secondly, in every city, just just like in Kano, the Federal High Court has two judges. How does it come to a situation where one judge of the Federal High Court 
not in the same city, Kano will make a decision on the same issue. And the other second judge of the Federal High Court will also make a decision on the same issue. This is what you, I will even use the word judicial rascality, even though I'm a lawyer, I will go with you and use that word. We should not be having that kind. How is it that in the same city, in the same court, court hall where they are sitting, the other judge could not have been aware that my his fellow judge is handling the same matter on the same issue. It's virtually impossible. But here we have two judges sitting using the same court premises, giving orders on the same issue in respect of the same parties. That should never happen. And then to compound the matter, a state high court in the same city weighing in and giving a contradictory role. Now, what do you expect the security agencies who are to provide security for enforcing the orders to do? I hear today that the, the security agencies, particularly the police, are now saying they are confused. Yeah, of course. About the contradictory court orders. What do they do in the circumstances? Fortunately, the Chief Justice of the Federation has summoned the judges from Kano State. And I hope uh, appropriate discipline action will be meted out to any judge found to be uh, involved in this mess. Now, having said that, we have what we call the National Judicial Council. That National Judicial Council is the council that exercises disciplinary uh, uh, action against judge, uh, judges of the Superior Court of Record. That is the High Court, the Court of Appeal, and the Supreme Court. Now, hold on, please, before you go into that. Now, we are now getting into that, um, because that, that's, that's actually going to be my uh, next question. Um, yes, we all know we have NJC, National Judicial Council. They are responsible to, for the regulation and the um, yeah, general regulation and the appointments of all the or nomination of all these uh, all the judges uh, sort of but um my question is this just i have pointed it earlier my concern that these people the punishment what you call punishment what njc does what the couple worst case scenario is that is they depose the person they either fire the judge or demote the judge or send the judge somewhere else that is uh, that is a dry environment or whatever it's a sort of so that is the punishment that is just the worst punishment uh, this judge is barrister is i don't know probably i i, I missed it but is there any in their code of conduct in their in their rules the njc's rules is there anywhere where it is stated that a judge can actually be sent to jail no, the, the NJC is not a court that can sentence somebody to jail. Yeah, sorry. That, it, I, I, sorry to a discipline I, I, body. I, yes, I understand that. No, sorry I asked it in a very lay way. Um, I understand that. Of course, you just can NJ, I know NJC, is, like I said earlier, it's a regulatory body um, that disciplines or whatever. My own, what, I, what I meant is sending someone to jail means can't has a judge been ever has ever has a judge been prosecuted in the history of judiciary in Nigeria? Is there any situation where a judge was actually prosecuted for 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 carrying out his or her role in a very very rascal manner, just like what we are having today? Well, there are. Let me explain the role of the NJC and then the role of the courts. Yes. In order to protect judges, to protect their independence, and to give them courage to dispense justice, there has been uh, procedures laid down. When it comes to disciplining a judge of the Superior Court, first of all, as it relates to his official duties as a judge, I'm not talking of if a judge goes out and commits a crime like a murder 
Yeah, like, of course, uh, of course not. Uh, yes. That is yes. separate. Yeah. In relation to his official duties as a judge, the process, the discipline process must first start with the uh, uh, NJC, the National Judicial Council. And their role is limited to considering the, the circumstances and either giving um, a warning. Some judges are giving warnings. Some judges are banned from being elevated to appellate court for a number of years. Some judges are retired compulsorily, and even some are dismissed from the bench. If the allegations rise up to criminal matters like bribery, it is left for the prosecuting agencies after discipline action has been taken by the NJC by way of either compulsory retirement, dismissal, or other form of discipline action. It's left for the appropriate prosecutorial agencies to prosecute the judges. And some judges have been prosecuted in the court. Even up to Supreme Court level, some judges have been prosecuted in the court in Nigeria. I know that's, that one. That's for 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 official misconducts. Yes, uh, what you call official misconduct, but has risen to the level of criminal conduct, like bribery and other okay. uh, uh, criminal matters. Some judges, even up to the Supreme Court, if you remember during Buhari's time, when uh, judges were raided, yeah, when the homes of judges, some of them were actually prosecuted in the court, although they were yeah. discharged. So that is the problem. The problem there is the inadequacy of the actions of the NJC and the prosecutorial agency, like EFCC, like ICPC, and like the police. On even on a general level, we have said that these agencies are not strong enough, they are not professional enough, they are not trained enough, they do not have adequate resources. So that impacts on their work, that impacts, impacts on their effectiveness in tackling challenges, not just in the judiciary, but across the board, across the country. So that is the situation we have. I would love to see a more vibrant NJC that takes almost immediate action, maximally within six months of a petition against a judge. And then I would also like a very effective interface between the NJC and the prosecuting agencies like AFCC, ICPC, and the police. Wherever the NJC finds conduct that is criminal in nature, they should swiftly refer the judges or such personnel to the relevant prosecuting agency. And it behoves on that agency to do it quickly and honestly and forthrightly. If that is not done, we will continue with the wrath that is happening in the ju judiciary today. Let me mention that only, uh, I think only this week, I filed a brief in, the, in one of the courts in Nigeria and I asked the question, have we reached a stage in Nigeria where you will be sitting in your house and your opponent or enemy will go to court behind your back and obtain an expert order and come and flush you and your family, your wife and children out of your house and seal it up. On an order that you were not heard, have we, we have reached that stage. It's already happening because it happened to a client of mine. He was not even in town, an expert order was brought and uh, he, he was flushed out, his uh, dependents and other people in the premises was flushed out, and his property was sealed up. What kind of judicial system will allow something like that to happen? Because the next thing, you are now outside your wife, your children are on the street trying to fight to come back into the premises. Should it not be that such an order should only be given when you are on notice to come and, and uh, present your case. So the abuse of expert orders has become rampant in Nigeria. 
And that must be looked into very, very quickly. Now, again, now I'm, I'm glad you brought this case because I forgot because I, I remember you, you told me about this case, for me about this case. Um, now, bring, that brings me back to another question that is important. By law, can an accused sue a judge, a victim of, of um, bad judgment from a judge? Or, bad, or a kind of misconduct, criminal misconduct from a judge? Can such victim take the judge to court? Can such judge be prosecuted by the victim? No. Insofar as the judge, uh, listen, insofar as the judge is acting in his role as a judge in a criminal, or in a case before him, he has what is called judicial privilege. Oh. And there is good reason for that. If you sit as a judge, you should not be afraid to dispense justice to the best of your knowledge and ability with a fear in mind that you could be prosecuted for what you have done, genuinely believing that you have done it with the best of your knowledge your training and your ability. That privilege extends to so many, if you know at the, for instance, at the executive level, the governors and the president have uh, privilege that they cannot be prosecuted while in office. At the same level, if you go to the National Assembly, whatever a person says on the floor of the house of is the privilege, house. legislative privilege. So a person can call you a 419, a terrorist, whatever, on the floor of the House or of the Senate, and you cannot sue him for that. Because these are chambers where people are given the freedom to express themselves without fear of criminal repercussions. So the, the intention is good. It also applies to a judge acting judiciary in the course of proceedings before him. Yeah, but no, but but uh, yeah, but all these officials who are uh, you pointed out, like the executive arm, uh, the judicial arm, the legislative arm, um, they 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 have statutes of limitation. Now, when they leave office, when they leave office, they can be prosecuted. But why can't the same principle, the same principle, be applied on judicial officials? Well. Let me let me say that there is what we call absolute and qualified privilege. The president can be prosecuted after he leaves office for criminal um, uh, acts that he performed. But like I said, if a judge, uh, that does not apply to a senator or a member of the House of Reps, for whatever he says on the floor, that is absolute privilege. That is absolute privilege. What you say on the house cannot, you cannot be prosecuted after your tenure has elapsed. Okay. So yeah. also what a judge says or does in the course of proceedings before him, that has absolute privilege. So privilege is qualified into now, now like like in this your case now your case with your the case you just mentioned with your client now the, your client now has suffered a whole lot of both uh, um, psychological and mental um, um, and uh, mental disorder or um, torment or whatever you whatever whatever you want to call it uh, who pays for such because just what you just rightly say that. This judge, this guy was not given justice about fair hearing. You have to give both sides fair hearing. If uh, if someone is being taken to court, is giving give um being prosecuted in one way or the other, the person should be given that uh, opportunity to defend himself or herself. And sort of. So in this case, just like you say, they don't pull the rug off this guy's cap without his not notice, without his knowledge. That is, he didn't know. Nobody no notice. That is what justice is about. You serve the other side. Not, you always serve the other party with the notice of one thing or the other that the court requires their attention to. Uh, so in this case, your 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 client is actually the one who, who is soft, who, who will bear the brunt 
who will bear the brunt of uh, the whole, um, I think uh, Barista Manta has got network issue. Um, let's see if he comes back because uh, this question is important. All right, I think uh, Barista is back. Uh, Barista, as I was asking, I don't know, probably I, hope so, I, 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 so, I suppose you didn't hear my question um, earlier. Now, the question is this, um, as uh, with regard to your, your client, um, let's use him as, an, as his case as an example now. Who pays for his misfortunes? Now, he was treated this way. He was, he was, he was um, evicted from his house without giving him fair, um, fair hearing to hear from his own side. He wasn't even around, just like you mentioned, and they didn't go through due process to actually, to actually carry out that eviction. So um, he has obviously he has faced humiliation. He has faced a psychological and mental distress, and, and possibly a financial um, financial uh, um, uh, issues as well. So who pays for this? How will this? I don't understand. So will people, someone responsible for this go scot free, or so, someone by law? What this man is passing through, I, I don't know. Definitely, he can go to court and reverse it. So what happens to his losses that I just mentioned, I just listed? Well, the, in this instance, the person who applied for the expatric order would have to... Uh, uh, action would be taken against such a person you can understand the predicament of the judge because when process is filed before a judge and the other party is not there, he, the judge relies on what is before him and what is before him can paint a pretty grim picture of urgency that a judge may say, okay, if this is the situation, I, I have nothing but to make the order to save or protect a situation that could be damaged if the order is not made. At that point, the judge has not heard the other party. So this party that came to court misled the court, failed to give uh, uh, material information to court just to, enable, to make the court make that order. Has to take responsibility for the damage that is caused to such a person. Okay, all right. I think um, we treated this case enough because we have so many other things to discuss, um, except you have a point that you forgot that you need to have. Otherwise, we shall be moving to the, the, to the next um, topic, um, which is uh, the national anthem and the controversy behind it. Um, what is your opinion? Uh, okay, before I ask for your opinion, um, this national anthem of a thing is, is just, I, I don't know, it's a time and season, it should be time and season for everything. Um, this is the, 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 the worst time to actually bring up such thing by the, by the federal. Nigeria has a, a, has a litany of problems, problems piling up every minute of the day um, that, requires our attention, the government's attention. I don't know why the National Assembly will spend our hard, uh, hard earned resources to actually deliberate on this matter, debate this matter, argue this matter, and eventually pass it into law. I don't know why they will, I don't know why we will, because we are spending money for God's sake. We need these resources, we need money. There are so many areas of, of important areas of the economy of the of the of the Nigerian system that that needs money desperately, needs resources desperately. That we do not that treating matter like this is just is just luxury. Um, it's just a waste of time. It's just a waste of resources. Nigeria's resources, hard earned resources, resources that we don't even have enough at this time. Why will lawmakers spend the time and resources to, to, to talk about, to debate this matter, for God's sake, bringing back old national anthem? What, old, what do we need? Is the, what is wrong with the, with the, the, ones we, with the one we the existing one we have? 
Why do we have to do? Why 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 will will our government even go delve into this? And it's first to the old national anthem. What are we hailing Nigeria for? Nigeria will so the, the old national anthem is so boring. I read I read it. I said that just sounds so boring. Eh? Compare in comparison with the, the one the or the, or the new national anthem, the supposed new because if we're talking about the old, the first one, the second one is better. It sounds better. That's not even my point. My point is. What for God's sake, what is the reason for us to what do you think is the reason for for Nigeria for the president to take this as a serious thing for God's sake? What are we hailing Nigeria for? Are we hailing, are we hailing what do, do we have any any anything good enough to hail Nigeria for? What is it? Okay, someone will say, okay, don't there is Nigeria, there are so many good things that Nigeria has done and good things that are happening. Yeah, but overwhelmingly, what we overwhelmingly what we have going on for us is just are, are just negativities and that is just it so what are we hailing nigeria for we are hailing nigeria for financial or uh, economic despondency or we are hailing nigeria for be, being the uh, second most corrupt nation in the world even for for second most corrupt nation in the world. or we are hailing nigeria what are we hailing nigeria for because that's what the first line the first line on the in, in the in the in the in the uh, the old uh, um, uh, national anthem says, "What are we hailing Nigeria for? We're hailing Nigeria for being for being because there is a report that that came out uh, recently. I said Nigeria is the second highest uh, most praying country in the world. That means we have we are we are we are full of we are we are uh, seriously apart. We are we are out behind Afghanistan. Afghanistan took first, and we are the second highest uh the highest uh, sorry second most praying country in the world that means we pray all the time yet we are we are the second most corrupt what what an irony for god's sake and so is that what we is that what we are hailing nigeria for we're hailing nigeria for poverty we're hailing nigeria for 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 inflation 34 per, almost 34 percent 33 point something percent inflation for god's sake this is unprecedented is that what we are hailing nigeria for what what is the essence of this of this crazy idea? Who brought whose idea was this for God's sake? And why will the president and the National Assembly spend our hard-earned resources eh, and time on such a matter? Please, Barista, what is your opinion on this? Well, there are there are, my opinion is there are two issues. Number one, psychophancy. And number two, diversionary tactics. Psychophancy in the sense that uh, President Tinubu has been known to have said beforehand, some years back, that he prefers the old national anthem. So in the Nigerian context, people are falling over themselves. Oh, the president likes this. So let's do it to curry favor with the president. That is why it could not even be subjected to a national debate. Nigerians' opinion did not matter. No, they could but, not but, no, 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 Barista, sorry to cut I'm you short. No, hold on. This issue of national debate, sorry to cut you short, because it is you we all know that this is Bola Tinubu's habit. He, he does not throw anything to national debate. He feels he feels he is God. He, he does everything with impunity. Is there anything? No, tell me, is there anything? Point out something, anything of national interest that Bola Tinubu has actually thrown out to the to the to the public for national debates. Nothing. So please continue. Well, we are not saying something different. I'm just saying the one of the reasons why it could not even be subjected to national debate is psychophancy. We want to please the president. The president wants the old national anthem. So let's pass it, and they pass it. And he quickly assented to it. Something that ought to have been subjected to Nigerians' opinion was not done. Secondly, I have told you on this platform that when a person comes to power without ideas, without what to do, they look for straws to catch. They look for diversionary tactics. This is one of them, to divert the attention of Nigerians from the crippling economic uh, uh, problems from the hunger and starvation. Already is a, 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 a debate in the bars across the board in offices, just like we are debating it. It's a sort of diversion of Nigerians from, from what they are facing. 
So the government that comes to power, the government that is there that does not know what to do, we grab at anything that will divert the attention of the of the people, and uh, let them go and be talking about that. At least part of their time, they will not be thinking about their suffering. They will be discussing this issue. Otherwise, there's absolutely no reason at this stage in our life. It is not our priority. There is no reason, good reason, to talk of national anthem at this stage. And when you look at the national anthem that was formulated by a colonialist, it was uh, formulated in 1959 and adopted on 1st October 1960 by a British lady. It was not Nigerian people. For an emerging nation that was about to gain its independence, that was 1959. They adopted on 1st of October 1960. It could be understood at that time, Nigeria was coming up with a lot of hope and a lot of promise. But 60 years after that, where are we? Where is truth and justice in Nigeria that you talk about in that anthem? Where is the peace that you talk about in that anthem? Where is the brotherhood that you are talking about in that anthem. The last stanza says, grant us one request, help us to build a nation where no man is oppressed. And so with peace and plenty, Nigeria may be blessed. 60 years after that, can we even talk anything resembling peace in Nigeria? anything resembling brotherhood, anything resembling freedom. These are things that should have uh, agitated the mind of a reasonable person. We look at this anthem and say, no, this anthem was composed for us by colonialists. Let's compose our own uh, uh, anthem by ourselves to reflect our aspirations. Then we compose the Arise or Compatriots. Five Nigerians composed yeah. that, uh, uh, that item, that uh, uh, Arise or Compatriots. The police band provided the music. The five Nigerians provided the relics for it. Now you come out and you say you are going to throw it away and revert to what was... Colonial uh, master, colonial master uh, did. Oh my God. When the uh, journalist asked him, asked Tinubu, he casually said that, well, the, the name Nigeria was given to us by the colonialists. Have we jettisoned the name? So if you go by that thought, why don't we go back? Why don't we go back and now, take the rule under the British? Now, before I, before I forget, now, because something I read in news uh, yesterday, that uh, was yesterday or two days ago, that Former uh, uh, P, uh, PRO, Lagos State Police uh, PRO, um, is actually trying to arrest and sue someone to court for, or rather suggested, I don't know if it's suggestion or trying to do that or whatever, to sue someone to court, a, a school actually, for- A school, yes. The school was said to have sung the yeah, 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 the, yeah, the, they the order, so, And they so, said they are going to arrest them. So as a lawyer, what is, the what, what, is well. by, what is by ability of such case? Can someone it's, be that, prosecuted? That, that is nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. If even the Tinubu himself, his ministers, if they put them here and say, sing the national anthem, I don't think 99% uh, yeah. of them will be here able to sing that old national anthem that has been, even if we are going to adopt it, a school with young children, they have to be taught most, we grew up under that old anthem, we can still remember, even me, I struggle I will struggle now to, to sing it, what of children that were, were not born during that anthem that anthem was jettisoned in 1989 school children who are in school now were never born by that time. They don't know about it. Is it not going to take a, a, a while to bring them up to learn and be able to sing that anthem? How can you sit somewhere and be talking rubbish that you arrest the principal? Or arrest? That is absolute rubbish. 
Honestly, that is that is crazy. Again, I mentioned this issue of uh, Bolat, you know, bringing things. Honestly, that thing is, is so annoying, so annoying that you want, you cannot throw out, bring out something for to, to the national discourse, something that will impact the nation. You want to change a policy. You want to do something that is significant, as significant as uh, taking off the salary for electricity, electricity, and uh, as significant of uh, taking off um, the uh, subsidy for electricity and taking up subsidy for a petroleum product. As significant as building the, the most expensive road road project in Nigeria, oh, and so, so so other issues or whatever. You don't you just you you this man does not consult anyone. All he does he does not consult the public. All he does is just concoct something, and the next thing, the moment we hear it today, there will be rumor. Before we even start to debate it in the public, the next day the, the implementation has begun. That is crazy. Um, it's so sad, so so sad. Okay, um, Barisa, let's go to the next topic, please. Um, um this uh, issue of uh, we have big churches, mega churches, men of God are so so rich these days. Um, most of them became rich uh, from the uh, contributions, um, membership contributions from the church members. And uh, they became stupid, stup uh, stinkingly, stinkingly rich, stupendously rich uh, as a result of investing, using churches money to invest in, in universities, in, invest in printing press, like, like Living Faith, uh, Winners Chapel virtually have a, they are into, uh, into aviation. Uh, the, the private jets now that the man has, I think about four or more, seven, whatever. I think he has commercialized them, a sort of, so they rent it out. So he's into, he's in the, into aviation, he's into printing, he's into um, estate, he's into education, he's into everything. These institutions, these uh, organizations, these companies were actually built by the church's money. And we have re redeemed Christian Church of God, the same thing, they are doing the same thing. The worst case is that this school, the schools they built with the, with the poor people's money. These same poor members cannot even attend these schools. I have people that are close to me that cannot attend these schools. They worship, they fellowship with this, with this, uh, with this, uh, with this, uh, with this, um, um, with these churches, and they can't even afford to, they can't afford to attend the schools. I am saying this because some of them, or if not all of them that I know, whatever, I am the one actually paying for their school fees. So they can't even afford it. And sort of, so that is a, that is the pro, that is the point. They can't afford to, to send their children to the schools that they actually contributed to build. Man of God, um, I sent a video to you of um, Femi Falana, uh, even though Femi Falana, I don't, I don't take him seriously. He's an old lawyer, but the way people respect him, I don't, I don't have iota of respect, like legal respect from the guy. Sometimes he just interprets the law in a different way, or whatever. That even me as a layman doesn't make sense. It's just some. He just he he applies activism to law, and this I always tell people: you don't, you cannot apply this two does not. You can if you want. Law is law. Activism is activism. He just applies activism to law, and most times he just he does he got he gets it wrong. A sort of so, but I had something from him, and I wanted I want to get your opinion because I, I trust your own legal interpretation of of of, of, of issues. A sort of, so, um, according to Femi, Femi Falana, that these churches, these mega churches, can uh, that, that are actual that what they are their their, their conducts are uh, are actually illegal, and when something when when a lawyer says something is illegal, it means that um such person can be prosecuted um can, can be prosecuted legally as well uh what is your opinion on that because according to him uh Femi Falana said um that these churches uh dipping their hands into the treasury to invest in one business or the other school uh universities and uh, secondary schools primary schools or whatever that it is illegal for them to do that. They ought not to do that. It means that someone can take them to court. Is it illegal for churches to do that, Barrister? I don't believe that it is uh, illegal. 
uh, you talk of illegality where something has been prohibited by law. The churches and other organizations, we call them charitable organizations. And as of today, in the old Companies and Allied Matters Act, they were incorporated under what we used to call Part C. That is incorporated trustees. In the new Companies and Allied Matters Act that was passed in 2020, they are in Part F. They are registered as incorporated trustees. Everywhere, not only here, where an organization's main purpose is charitable uh, purposes, they can go into establishing uh, things like schools, hospitals, and other charitable um, distance. These institutions, these hospitals, these schools, they bridge the gap between what the government can provide and uh, what the private people can provide. It is a good thing for the country. In Nigeria, if it is not for churches and missionary schools providing uh, education, providing hospital services, I don't know where the country would have been. So per se, there's nothing illegal about a church having a school, having a hospital, or running a charitable body. Part of their objects are precisely for charity. Even though, even the preaching of, of the word of God is charitable in nature. So I cannot see how or with what respect you can argue that a church establishing a university is an illegal business. It is not. And I'm yet to be sure any law. Yeah, but, but if you, okay, I understand what you are trying to say, but what, now you talked about charitable organization. What is the essence of, what is the basic essence or the, the rudiments of a charity organization, any charity organization? Um, of course, it is to take care of the less privileged people who cannot afford basic necessities of life. A sort of so and this church is just like you mentioned if they are charitable of if they are charitable organizations and based on the on the um on the CAC Act um business establishment act they are expected it's expected that their members are able to attend these institutions so what have you got to say about that well legally speaking that is a different issue altogether whether their members are able to assess the hospitals they established or the institutions they established, it's not a legal matter. It's a different ball game. I have uh, in the past uh, spoken on this issue that churches organize um, uh, schools, established schools and hospitals, which its members cannot financially assess. But you also have to take into account that the establishment of schools and hospitals is not just based on the church alone. There are also uh, laws that affect the establishment of such institutions and standards are set by the regulatory agencies for such hospitals, for such schools to meet. The issue is if a church that draws its finance from its members establishes a school, it stands to reason that even the most, uh, the poorest among the church members should be able to assess that school or have medical services from such hospitals. But then you have to just oppose it with the fact that the standards in that school have to be maintained they are set by law, they have to be maintained. You don't just establish a university and make it a mushroom place to ensure that your members assess it. The, the difference between keeping it at that uh, standard and bringing it down, bringing the standard down to enable your members assess it is the issue that will be discussed. 
we have to look for ways for the church to enable or ensure that its members access those schools. And don't forget, these schools and hospitals are not attended to, are not attended or assessed by just the church members. The rest of us in the society also have access to it. So what we should be talking about is for such churches to devise a formula or way whereby its members can be accommodated, even if they don't have the financial muscle. It can be done in the form of scholarship. It can be done in other ways that can be devised so that the members of the church cannot be thrown out on the basis of financial inadequacy in attending this. But for somebody to just say, oh, you established a church and your members cannot attend. So that is wrong. I think they should re-examine it in terms of the maintaining the quality of that school, maintaining the quality of that hospital, vis-a-vis -vis the finances available to allow all the members of the church. If you take Living Faith, for example, they have millions of members in Nigeria and worldwide. If you say, okay, you are going to bring down the school fees of the Living Faith universities to such a level that the average member should attend. Then you have to contend with where you will get money to keep the standard of the school at the appropriate level. So we, let's look at it objectively and compare what can be done, what can be devised by the uh, church to ensure that their members are not left behind in these institutions that they established. That no, is my view. No, yeah, okay. Thank God that is your view. Me, I don't view it that way. I don't want us to dwell on this because I want to I don't want to tell us to deal on the legal aspect of it. But let me just briefly say something. Now, um, the truth is, the churches are so rich enough that they can take care of their schools should be able to, they can sustain that standard and take care of uh, the poorest of the poor in, in, their, in their churches, a sort of, uh, at their hospitals and, or um, at their schools, uh, a sort of. So don't, don't tell me that because every week, every service day, they, they, it's, they, they still generate resources, income from their services, these same poor people keep, keep contributing, still keep giving and giving. They can actually say, look, that is, that is why you call it charitable organization. They are supposed to be charity organizations. So charity organization is supposed to be non-profit. What these institutions, both the hospitals and the, and, the, and the educational institutions, the primary school, the secondary school, the universities, or whatever, that they are, they are massively profit-making. They are making a whole of humongous profit of this. This is not supposed to be. Look, I, I, I think, I think, I still think that as a layman, I, I, I think that there is a kind of, if not that's not, it, it's, it's ambiguous. It could be ambiguous, though, an ambiguous legal implication to what they are doing, because if it's a charity organization, established as a charity organization. It's supposed to, all charity organization by law is not supposed to be non, it's supposed, it's supposed to be non-profit. They are not supposed to be profitable. So they are supposed to be treat, they, they are, the essence is to treat humanity. That does the truth, to take care of humanity. Everything has to be humane. It is not enterprising. It is not business. It's not supposed to be business. It's not supposed to be cap capitalist base. A sort of, uh, so that is the point. Um, you don't, you don't just, like I said earlier, it, these churches make money every day. They, it's a, it, it, uh, it's it's a every day turnover. Um, every day or every week or every day, three times a week. Any time they call, every time there is a service in these churches, they always. They, they, in fact, in my own judgment, so I, I I I think I in my opinion, I it's, it most of these churches they organize this weekly store program here and there just to make money out of it. That just is some of them, and that is just it. A sort of not for uh, they are not for selfless reasons, but for just for personal aggrandizement to make because any any service they hold, any weekly or whatever any service they hold, they will always call for offerings. Uh, sort of, so that is the point, uh, uh, Barista. The, I don't. I, that is there, there is no. As they can still maintain that. As I said, earlier, they can still maintain that standard with the resources they are generating on daily basis in these churches. 
while they they um, they they admit poor people that cannot afford those or whatever. So let's not even go into that. I think I disagree with you on that. Let's move let to the me, next. Let me add something. Yes. On this issue, you know, for a very long time, these churches and other charitable organizations were a law unto themselves. Yeah. But the government, or oh, there has been agitation that they should be for a long time. So for the first time in Nigeria, even though it is happening elsewhere like UK, for the first time in Nigeria, the amendment to the Companies and Allied Matters Act that was done in 2020 yes. has given the Corporate Affairs Commission the management them. of the, yes. a church to dissolve the trustees, to suspend the trustees and appoint a management of the trustees where the uh, income of the uh, church, for instance, is not being applied in accordance with the law. So the, this provision companies and allied matters act to oversight the churches in particular. So it is left for the regulatory agencies now, and they are under an obligation to send a biannual statement of affairs to the CAC and, and maintain accounting records to be kept and file annual returns to the CAC. So all these are meant to for the regulatory agencies to check whether the income of the churches is being which the churches are formed, and where they see that it is not, or where they see that they are being run fraudulently, they have the power to appoint a management team to take over that institution or that church. Yeah, I think that is right. I remember then when they came back with such a policy, uh, the whole, all those, especially the big churches, just started crying foul. That is the best thing, honestly, because these churches are, they are all. All these mega churches, they are all business. Honestly, I don't consider them as the, really the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't consider them to be that same church in the New Testament. I, these are these are businesses that are running I, I, because I don't I can't. Why will someone, a man of God, have pri four private jets for God's sake? Why will a man? Why will someone be driving a Rolls Royce or whatever, living in op opulence and luxury and affluence or whatever when you have over the poor reading people in the church? They keep contributing their small, small money eh? every, fact, every day of the week. In fact, I have very strong uh, this thing when you are discussing religious issues. But I have very strong um, opinions on what you have just said. Somebody, I think somebody wrote an article that Freaks my mind, and I have <coughs> I have been dealing with that article for a long time. I think one professor, John Amoda, he wrote an article out of his business and traders in the business of God, and it pricked my my thinking for a long time. article. Is that look, God goes. This is the way God goes about. This is the way Christ went about the business of God. Why? God did it. Christ did it. Why are we followers of Christ? Whom? Why are we not going about God's business in the manner of God? Why are we using Caesar's resources for God's business? Because Christ did not use Caesar. Um, uh, uh, Barista, <laughs> can you please, can you please, because uh, honestly, it's an interesting point you are trying to make, but I am not, the line is breaking. I didn't hear suspension, and I believe our audience will not hear suspension part of what you just, the point you are trying to make. Can you repeat the point again, please? Let's, I hope the network operates this time around. The point, the point I'm trying to make is this. God of his business and traders in the business of God. Yes. So there is a way God went about his business. 
by power. There is a way Christ went about his business, the business of God, by power. Why are we Christians not going about God's business in that way? Because Christians can do more. Why are we now applying uh, Caesar's methods? He has answered it for me. Because they said some, some of the pastors have said, oh, if we don't tax our members, if we don't collect this, Jesus run his church. And how did God run his church? That is the point. How God did God you. run his church? When Christ was confronted, did Christ ever tax him? Did he come to him? Did he collect any tithe from them? That is when the point. he was to pay tax, when they came him, for himself and his uh, disciples. Did he, did he not, raise... He, yeah, that's did the he, point. He, he didn't raise money he from his disciples. Members. Yeah, he but performed are, a miracle. You're right. That's the point you're making. Go catch a fish, open his mouth, remove the coin, and go and pay the tax. And all this... do far more. But when we now come, why are our pastors not going about God's business in God's methods? Yeah, that's his point. His point to go about what they claim is God's business. It's actually Caesar's business. Yeah. More or less. That's why I agree. Churches are in business as we believe they are. They, yeah. should, be, they should be taxed. That is it, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Unfortunately, um, we cannot deal with this with the last topic, which is the last topic will take us a whole lot of time. Besides, um, network is not cooperating now. We have to we defer that last topic, and it's a topic that have been have been moving forward for some time now. It's upon something we are supposed to have discussed, but unfortunately, we cannot do that. Network is not cooperating. Um, from um, barrister's end. So um, we will move that topic to the next, uh, to our, probably um, our next segment. So viewers, um, sorry, we can't discuss the topic, um, the last topic. So we are, I'm, I will be coming, calling this to a close right now. Um, we've been having discussion, very insightful and educative um, discussion with uh, Barrister Austin Manta who has um, who has has never failed when it comes to when it comes to actually analyzing issues and uh, he's a very he's a very very insightful person when it comes to analyzing matters the matters arising and uh, we appreciate him for that um, viewers um, again my name is Jibrin this is my angle called the Jibrin angle and um, I hope you will be will you join us once again if you have not subscribed please um, subscribe to this platform so that uh, you follow us and uh, it kind of encourage us to grow. We appreciate um, that you are here. We appreciate that you are watching us even up to the end of the show. And um, we, 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 are, I, we hope that um, you will keep, you will keep, you will keep, keep staying with us and uh, um, keep encouraging us and uh, say uh, by this point, say uh, remain blessed and see you next time again.